This is Bill McCord speaking for Red Book and inviting you to eavesdrop on a fascinating backstage conversation between two of the most talked about entertainers in the world. America's Judy Garland, Britain's Noel Coward. Here in a special celebrity dialogue recorded for a feature article in the current issue of Red Book, you'll hear them not talked about this time, but speaking for themselves. The subject, what it means to be a real show business pro. Well, I'll tell you the thing that is interesting. Let's just, before we start, decide what is interesting about Judy and me as performers. A, we're very old friends, so that takes care of itself. B, Judy's been with me. Uh, she was with me in my opening night in Las Vegas. And in, in moments of crisis in my career, Judy appears. And so she's a valued and beloved friend of mine, so that's all right. What is interesting about us both is she is probably the greatest singer of songs alive. I'm not so bad myself when I do my comedy numbers. And we know a great deal about our job because we're very professional. This should be interesting if we get onto that. The, the, the way to handle audiences, the way to keep them quiet, when you want them, and make them laugh when you want them, and stop them laughing when you don't want them mm. to. I think so. I think That's I the sort so. of thing we could yes. have a bash at. I think so. I think so indeed. I think that's probably what people might be interested in. Uh, Certainly, you're a good springboard. And I've seen you with Bar and what you did with 50,000 human beings, which I believe is incredible. I with no voice. Did no. you see the second one uh, when I, I had no voice? No, I saw the first one. Oh, the first one I had. Oh, it's fun when you have no voice. Oh, it's lots it? of laughs, especially at Forest Hills. When, when they're doing the war, when we were doing the, uh, when I was doing the um, troops, yeah. you know, in the open air, mm -hmm. on a tank transport, and the mic mm -hmm. goes wrong. <laughs> you, know, you know why you're professional. It's because you have to be professional. You have to fall back on every trick in the book. You have to... Take the note, you know you can't hit, with such a radiant smile that they <laughs> think it's wonderful. Exactly. <laughs> yes. And, you and, 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 and also act. Cheap acting. Cheap you know, acting cheap and acting. immense <laughs> calm. <laughs> with your heart <laughs> pounding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, but the thing is, is that when you know you're coming to that particular note, and you know it's there, and there's no way to avoid it, you know, you can't take it enough to step down. And you know it's coming, and you know that it's going to sound ghastly. And you yes. think, all for, for the 28 bars, four, or whatever. You're you think, waiting. How will I get? And you get there, and it is lousy. You know, yes, you, yes. It, it never but, is. But you pass it off by being... And, and you do it a gesture you've never done before. Yes, yes you've A radiant sound. <laughs> <laughs> the first night that I opened at the Café de Paris in London, yeah. with the whole of London waiting yeah. to see how lousy I was going to be, <laughs> I lost my voice completely. <laughs> completely. And for an hour before the show, my doctor, throat doctor, was marvellous. Tinged up, and I took my vocal cords and threw them in the air like ping-pong balls. <laughs> and, and, very and I went down those stairs. I'm not as a rule as you know, over nervous because I can't afford to be. But I was good and nervous then because I didn't know what sound was coming out. And I opened my mouth and a very curious voice emerged <laughs> that I couldn't recognize at all. <laughs> but it went all right. But, 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 went all right. It was terrible. Yes. Oh, darling. But then I quickly got into some comedy numbers and saved myself. Some interesting backstage observations from Noel Coward and Judy Garland. A special celebrity dialogue feature furnished by Red Book magazine. This is Bill McCord speaking for Red Book and inviting you to engage in a bit of eavesdropping, completely conscience-free, and to a fascinating combination of conversationalists, too. The man, the sophisticated and urbane actor, composer, playwright from Britain, Mr. Noel Coward. His companion, one of the most beloved figures of American show business, Miss Judy Garland. A recent backstage conversation between the two was recorded for a special feature in the current issue of Red Book. And we think you'll enjoy listening in now as these two ace performers compare notes about their early years in show business. How old were you? Well, what, how old were you when you started? Two. Two. Oh, you beat me. I was ten. I started at the age of ten on, in the theater. 
But before that, I'd been in ballet school. So I started in ballet. Oh, were you going to be a dancer now? Or yes, I remain. I was a dancer for quite a while. Fred Astaire did two dances for me in 1923. Did he? Yes, really. What do you mean he did two? Well, he choreographed, choreographed two dances for Gertie Lawrence and me. One for Gertie and me, and one for me alone. I didn't know. In one of the, your own place? Yes, in the Review, London Calling, the Charlotte Review. How marvelous! I, I didn't know that. Oh, he Does was Fred ever, ever talk about this? Uh, uh, I don't think he was very proud of the dances because I don't think they were very well executed. <laughs> <laughs> Were they well Very brilliant. But there was a lot of that cane whacking and the Yes, it's the office. Da, 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 Where did you, your, did you have any background? Was there anyone else in your family at all? Theatre? No theatre, no. Navy. Navy? All my mother's family were Navy. But no theatre at all. Nothing. We didn't know anything about it. I was taken to my first play when I was five years old. And every it was my birthday treat. Every 16th of December, I used to be taken to a theatre. And then I was given a toy theatre for Christmas. Uh, by your mother? By my mother. Uh, she, well, then she must have had some well, love she do- the theatre. she loved the theatre, you see. Okay. She used to love going to the theatre. Yeah. And, yeah. and I was wildly enthusiastic about yeah. it. And so that's how it all started. But you see, the reason that uh, I went onto the stage was I was set to go into the Chapel Royal Choir because I had a, a perfectly beautiful boy's voice. Yeah. And so I went to the Chapel Royal School and I trained and trained to be ready for the great moment when I gave an audition for the Chapel Royal Choir, which is a very smart thing to be in. Yes. And I suppose the inherent acting in me <laughs> headed this ugly rear because um, <laughs> I did Gounod's There is a Green Hill Far Away, not the ordinary one, but the Gounod one. Mm. And I tore myself to shreds. I made Callus look like an amateur. <laughs> and the poor man, the organist, fell back in horror. I gave it the expression. I did the whole crucifixion bit. <laughs> and they turned me down because I was overdramatic. You and mean my, just, just, and I was up, your voice? Just and I was only nine dramatic. and a half with an eaten collar going... Oh, there was no other good enough to pay the price of I did the whole lot. And so that... And so then Mother was very, very, very cross and said the man was common and stupid anyway who turned me down. <laughs> and then we saw an advertisement in the paper that said they wanted a, a handsome, talented boy. And we looked at me and said, well, you're talented. And maybe you can get by on looks. And off I went and gave an audition. And that's how I got in the stage. Some interesting self-revelations about early show business years of Noel Coward and Judy Garland, a celebrity dialogue feature furnished by Red Book magazine. This is Bill McCord speaking for Red Book, inviting you to listen in on a conversation between America's Judy Garland and Britain's Noel Coward, two round-the-world favorites who have experienced life at the heights of show business and also a few of the valleys. Was all the anguish worth it? We think you'll be interested in the two stars' thoughts on the subject, as expressed during a special interview recorded as the basis for a feature in the current issue of Red Book. The Shriners have always made me cry. <laughs> but they have the prettiest hats. Their hats were done by Dashay, these Shriners. Uh, they were. But, but, it, but it, was, it didn't help. The figures were not done by Dashay. The hats no. may have been. That was an odd party. Yeah, I thought it was very enjoyable. And there was... Oh, a, no. In Mary, so funny. <laughs> But there were far too many people at it. But I was slightly proud that the, that the enormous picture of George Washington had been taken off the wall and one of mine substituted. Oh, really? I thought, this is a really very... I didn't know that. You didn't tell me that. Well, they have a picture of me looking like a, a very a old bull moose, blown up in place of George Washington. Well, that's pretty good. Well, it's a, in Boston, considering the Boston <laughs> Tea Party, this was really very kind of them. Yes. But they've forgiven us for that. Child stars and child people, you know, who started as a theater. Would you have done another career instead of? Oh no, I'm still stage struck. Mm. But I was going to say, ask Judy one thing, because I'm absolutely sure of something. Yes. 
when I saw Judy when she was a little girl, although she talks about the vaudeville and all those things, but of course that is the way to learn theatre and not acting school. Playing to audiences, however badly, however Trial and error, trial and error. And you see, when I see her appearing now, and come on as this great star before an audience, with the authority of a great star, she knows exactly, she's, uh, this is not in one of her cow-like moods, it's when she comes on <laughs> and really <laughs> takes hold of that audience. I know that every single heartbreak she had when she was a little girl, every number that was taken away from her, every disappointment she had, went to make this authority. Exactly, exactly. And it's, and it's, it, it, it's all, it sounds like the most Pollyanna and sort of awful thing to say, but it truly is worth it. When you can uh, arrive... There is something you know. When you can walk out and handle hundreds of people and make them enjoy themselves. And it's only something you can learn through. Nobody can teach you. No rate. correspondence course, no theories, no, no rehearsals in no. studios. Just working in front of I assure you that I would never have been a success at the Café de Paris or in Las Vegas if it hadn't been for three years singing to troops. Because very often the troops didn't wish to see me at all. They would love to have seen Marlena, they would love to have seen a glamorous lady, or a comic who could drop his pants and get a laugh. They didn't want to see me coming on and being sophisticated. But I also knew that if I played down to them and altered my material, mm. they'd see through it. Mm. So I had to make them like what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And on the whole, I succeeded. Not always. I had a few bad moments. Sometimes it takes me about 20 minutes to get. But you were never played down. You never, never. you never, in other because, words, you brought them up Because they would see you. through it. They would see through it. Some observations from two celebrated alumni of the show business school of hard knocks, Mr. Noel Coward and Miss Judy Garland. This celebrity dialogue feature was furnished by Red Book Magazine. This is Bill McCord speaking for Red Book and inviting you to listen in on a conversation which you might expect to be labeled strictly private, but in this case was picked up by a microphone in the course of a frank and revealing discussion feature in the current issue of Red Book. The conversationalists are two of the most celebrated figures in contemporary show business, Noel Coward and Judy Garland. Subject, the therapeutic values of heartbreak and disappointment. I've known you for many years. You've always done this. You are a terribly uh, wise man who, in spite of many facets of talent and brilliance and so forth, has kept your, you have kept your mind in complete order and your emotions in order. And your, you have great style and great uh, uh, taste in the way you... How did you, when, were you ever uh, uh, inclined to, to fall into uh, sort of self-pity and... Oh, and, and yes, and yes, yes. Oh, good, it makes me oh, feel much better. Because yes. I, <laughs> this is I after really, all, Judy, really darling. for a long time. I'm much older than you. Not I've much been, anymore. I've I been on the stage for 51 years. And I, all my early years were spent under studying running around the country and touring companies and everything. And gradually, when I, I start, I certainly had my first successes very early for anybody. I was only in my early 20s. Mm. Well, the, the but, Vortex, uh, how old were you when you did the Vortex? 24. My God. My God. It opened in London on my 25th birthday. Didn't it open in Chelsea? In, uh, it opened up in Hampstead when I was still 24. I was 25 in a night group in London. And then I went through a dangerous phase after the Vortex, because suddenly everything became a success. Then I was in great danger, and I learned some lessons, mm -hmm. because I wrote one or two things that weren't so good. Well, what, what, uh, oh, darling, no, for a long time you wrote things that were completely successful and completely... Booed off the stage and spat out in the streets in London at the age of 27, I was. 
booed off the oh, stage oh. by the public on an opening night and spat at outside the after, stage door. After the vortex? No, after play court. No, the vortex. I know, but that was 24. Three years and... later. Well, for, for, what, uh, for what reason? Because I had made this meteoric rise and yes. I had five, had, had five plays running at once and I was the belle of the ball and they got sick of it. They wanted and to. I them. got careless. I thought it was easy. I see. And it's never easy. No, no, it never is. No. But no. that was a shock. A fascinating... It, it didn't hurt me. It merely made me no, a bit of cross. it was a traumatic old Yeah. Well, you yeah. probably thought anything you could do, they would accept and love and adore. Well, when you're told, so I'm saying, for instance, if I p had a list handed me now of the compliments I was paid last night over this show... I would now get into a nice car and drive to Martha's Vineyard and have a lovely holiday with Kit Cornell and lie in the sun. But as I know that last night had a wonderful audience, receptive and kindly and warm, the show, considering it was an out-of-town opening, was remarkably slick. Now is when I start work. Really? Oh, yes. How marvelous now. by Judy Garland and Noel Coward. This special celebrity dialogue feature was furnished by Red Book magazine. This is Bill McCord speaking for Red Book. Do the top performers of the entertainment world play parts off stage as well as on? You'll be interested, I think, in some very personal opinions on this subject from two of the top performers around these days, Miss Judy Garland and Mr. Noel Coward. Their remarks were picked up by the microphone in the course of a frank and revealing backstage conversation recorded for a feature in the current issue of Red Book. Here's what they have to say. Why must you be entertaining? Because we were born to it. We were born to it. Can't, you can't avoid it. You, you're wrong. Judy, Judy and I went into that party last night. I was absolutely exhausted because a big opening night. I'd been rehearsing during the day. I'd been working frightfully hard these last few weeks. Judy came into the party. I got there a little before her. And immediately became Judy Garland. <laughs> Stop being Judy. I was no more Noel. I was no coward. Debonair, witty, charming. And I was and, Dorothy Adorable. And you were just Dorothy Adorable. Just and we smiled. And we were such good and sorts. Ah. And do you know, to go on being a good sort in public for a long time is very wearing. Because we weren't feeling good sorts at all. What we wanted to do was to come back here, which ultimately we did. Put on some slacks. And put on some, the floor. take our shoes off and have a drink and discuss the, the show. But it was done. And you know, and I'm, you go home I'm getting screaming. so old, I wonder why I do it anymore, but I still do. I guess, I suppose it's something we never, we never... Uh, we show people. I suppose, because I remember one night I was recording in London. I recorded for hours, what, four or five hours, and a party was given for me afterwards. I got there and everyone had eaten. There were just sort of remains on the table, you know, awful strings of cold ham and wilted lettuce, and, uh, but I was so hungry that I'd take anything. and. I, uh, I, I think the hostess said, now, here, I'll get you some food. She brought me this miserable plate of food and then said, now, everybody's been waiting for you to sing. And I said, but I've, I've just been singing for five hours, you know. It didn't make any difference. They just smiled. And I went and we sang for another three of hours. Course. We really did. And went home on our hands and knees, just so tired. I'll tell you one little story that happened to me during the war. <laughs> I had been in the canal zone outside Cairo, and I'd done five hospitals in the heat of summer in Cairo. I got back and found a message saying, King Farouk giving a party and will you come? So I obediently went off, and there was one of the most boring social parties I've ever seen with King Farouk came up to me very courteously and said, Mr. Card, would you sing us a few songs? So I went to the piano, and I sang a number, and everybody was uh, fairly attentive, but sort of restless. 
And then I started off on night and day. And I did the drip, drip, drip of the raindrop and everything. And then everybody got quiet except King Farouk, who was sitting about as near to me as you are, with the lady, and he was like, well, well was, <laughs> <laughs> and so I got, and I got to the chorus and lost my temper, and I went, in the roaring traffic's boom, in the silence, <laughs> and he stopped dead, and there was a terrible hush, and then I said, of my loan, you know, my <laughs> Some off-the-cuff comments from Judy Garland and Noel Coward on the parts performers sometimes have to play offstage. This celebrity dialogue feature was furnished by Red Book Magazine. We'll be here till next Thursday. <laughs> Oh!